God. Thank you, Lord God. Father God, we thank you for increase. We thank you for growth. We thank you for development. We thank you that we're going higher in you. I declare that we are hearing your voice clearly when we are obeying the instructions that you give. And as we obey, glory to God, you increase us more and more. Thank you, Lord, for spiritual maturity. Thank you, Lord God, for growth and development. Thank you that you're taking us higher in you so that we can be a blessing to those that you lead us to. Lord, as we prepare to position ourselves to hear from you today, I thank you that your word brings about the increase. So let every person here receive your word. On an individual basis, Lord, I pray that your word, as it is heard, causes the increase of our spirit, man, to receive from you what we need to grow in you, to do what you've called and created us to do, to be who you've called and created us to be. So we position our hearts to receive, and as the seed of your word is sown into our hearts, we believe that we will reap a harvest of increase. 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 We receive it right now, Lord God, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a shout of praise as you take your seat. Hallelujah. You know. If you pray for increase, you got to expect increase. You got to look for it. You just can't pray for it and then not have your expectations set to see it. Amen? Amen. So as we pray for increase, we thank God in advance that we are increasing more and more day by day. Glory to God. Well, I'm excited to get the word to you. I'm going to share a real quick kingdom nugget with you and then we'll get into our series spiritual nutrition. We are on lesson three, and I believe it's going to really be a blessing for you. If you need a, a tithe offering envelope, raise your hands. The ushers will get one to you. I'm not going to be on here for too long. I uh, was having a conversation with someone during before service started, and it really just showed me, or it's been resonating in my heart since we had the conversation. And so my instruction for us today around the kingdom nugget is simply this. Follow instructions. Follow the instructions. The word of God gives us the instruction. Now, if we're expecting increase, then we have to follow the instructions that lead to increase. Amen. Isaiah 119 says, if you be willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the lamb. But verse 20 also tells us, but if we refuse and rebel, we'll be devoured by the sword. That just means that if you don't follow the instructions I give you, you'll be subject to things I never wanted you to experience. And so for us, especially with our declaration that we're praying for and believing God for increase, we want to ensure that we follow the instructions that God gives us in his word. Even when you don't understand them, even when they don't make sense to you, follow the instruction anyway, because it's in the obedience that the blessing is released. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Not in the understanding, in the obedience. I can pray for understanding. Understanding will come. The Bible says, and all you're getting, get understanding. So I'm not saying that we don't need understanding. What I'm saying is that understanding is not a requirement for obedience. We've been told to do things. We knew that growing up in school. You were told to do things in, stu in school. You didn't understand them, but you obeyed, and then you got the necessary grade based on your obedience. Well, God is letting us know that there are things that he has for us that require our obedience to his instruction, and you don't have to understand the instruction to obey what he says. So as far as giving is concerned, I believe that the tithe belongs to God. That's what I teach to you. So we don't pay tithe. We return what belongs to God to him. We return the tithe to God. That's holy unto him. And when we, when we honor him and obey him by returning the tithes to, them, to him, he opens the windows of heaven. He pours out a blessing that we don't have room enough to receive. Even if you don't understand that, you can still obey that and receive the blessing from that. Amen. And for us, I believe our lives should be uh, signified by our giving. The Bible lets us know that when we give, 
It'll be given unto us good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. It says men will give into your bosom. What that means is that when I obey the principles of the kingdom of God, when I commit to be a giver, God places it on the hearts of people to give back to me. Even if they don't know me, even if they don't like me, even if they don't really want to do it, God will put it on the hearts of people to be a blessing to me because he knows I am a giver. Amen. Hallelujah. So we follow the instruction. Even when it's difficult, even when we don't understand, we follow the instruction and our obedience to the instruction will cause the blessing to rest on our endeavors. That's good, Lord. Our obedience to the instruction will cause his blessing to rest on our endeavors. So whatever it is you're doing, just declare that the blessing of God is on what you're doing to cause what you're doing to increase. Amen. Because we're honoring him, we're following instruction. He told us to do it, we're going to do it, and as we do it, he's going to bless it. How do you know that, Pastor Jake? Because he says so in his word. And I believe his word from the top to the bottom, inside and out. So if he said it, I believe it. For me, that settles it. I don't have any qualms about it. I don't have any reservations. I trust his word. And I want us all to be in that same place to where I trust his word independent of my own understanding or lack thereof. I trust his word even though it's not popular. I trust his word even though culture doesn't agree. I trust his word even though people might not see it the way I see it. I trust his word because my success is where? In God's word. So the only way I can be successful, he said, meditate in this book of the law day and night. He goes on to tell Joshua, you'll make your way prosperous and you'll have good success which means it's possible to have bad success. Bad success is I achieved my goal, but it wasn't God's will. So we want to have good success where not only do we achieve our goal, it's also God's will for us to do it. And one of the ways that we obey him is by returning the tithe to him and by sowing seed into the kingdom of God. You sow it to your local church. So, you know, the church, I know you say, well, where is God? If I'm returning my tithe, I don't see God in service. Well, you can't see God anyway. God is a spirit. It's an act of our faith. It's an act of obedience. When I return the tithe to him, he releases the blessing unto me, and it goes to facilitate what that local church, what that local body has to do. Amen? Because, you know, God, you, I'm sure y'all have heard it said before, God doesn't need your money. Anybody ever heard that before? It's really true. He owns everything. He created everything. So it's not the money that he's looking for. It's the heart posture. It's the obedience that he requires. It's him saying, I want to see you do what I'm telling you to do. And if you do what I'm telling you to do, I'm going to do what I said I would do in your life. Amen. Amen. Praise God. So if you got your tithe or your offering in your hand, let's say this. Oh, let me pray over your giving. Father God, I thank you for an opportunity to obey your instructions by returning the tithe to you as well as an opportunity to receive exceeding abundantly and above all we ask or think by operating the system and the principle of sowing and reaping. Lord, you know every individual situation. You know exactly what they need, and you already know what you supplied. So I pray that as we obey your instruction today and as we sow into the kingdom of God, as we return the tithe to you, that you obey your word, you follow through, you stand behind your word, and you open the windows of heaven. You pour out a blessing that we don't have room enough to receive. You rebuke the devourer for our sake. You speak to the hearts and minds of men all over the place to give into our lives simply because we are obedient to your instruction. Lord, I declare increase over every giver. I declare increase over every sower of seed. And I declare right now in the name of Jesus that every ounce of lack and insufficiency is swallowed up by the blessing. And your blessing not only hits our lives, it rests on our lives and causes everything we do to prosper and succeed in Jesus name. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, remember when you drop your, your giving in the giving receptacles at the rear of the sanctuary, remember to release your faith as you do it. If you're returning your tithe, just let the Lord know, Lord, I'm releasing my faith for your divine supply. If you're sowing seed, just say something to release your faith because you don't want to just drop it. You want to actually sow it into the kingdom. So you want to make sure you go through the process of sowing it. Speak over it. I sometimes speak over the times before I even get to the church because I want God to know what my intent and what my heart is. Amen. 
You speak over your giving. You give your, that's good. You give your giving some direction. You give it some instruction. You let it know what it needs to do so God can honor your faith. Amen? Hallelujah. Well, y'all might not believe it, but that's my nugget. Y'all might not believe it, but that is my nugget. Y'all ready for the word? Because I need, I need all my time for this word, I'm telling you. So let's, let's get ready to, to really receive this. This is probably something that is so necessary for where God is taking us, what God is doing for us, because if, if we don't get this right, it could, I, won't, I don't want to say negatively impact, but it could cause some issues later on our, on our track of development, not just corporately, but as an individual believer, we have to make sure that we embrace what God is telling us. So we're going to begin with lesson three of our series titled Spiritual Nutrition. And I'm not going to do any review today. I am going to read uh, our lesson text from 1 Peter chapter 2, and I'll also read from Matthew chapter 4 so we can have an understanding of where we're going. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, in the King James Version of the Bible says, As newborn babes... Desire, say desire. desire, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may what? Grow thereby. And then in Matthew chapter four, verse four, I love this. It says a man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So that means there's nothing wrong with natural food. What the Lord is showing us is that for the believer, natural food ain't enough. Man doesn't live by bread alone. Man also lives by every word that proceeds or that comes out of the mouth of God. I like it in the Amplified Version. It says, man shall not live and be upheld and sustained by bread alone, but by every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. So that means if I don't know the word of God, I'm not living life the way he wants me to live it. Jesus said, I came that you might have life and that you might have life more abundantly. So if we connect that to what he's saying, that man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, in order for me to live the abundant life that God wants me to have, I have to digest the word as often as possible. Amen? Amen? That's what he showed me. That's what got me on the right track when I realized that my success was in his word. He shared that with me. He showed and revealed that to me long before I knew I was called to be a pastor. I just knew there was more that God wanted for me, and I knew I wasn't doing it. And one of the scriptures that led me into alignment with his will was Joshua 1.8. I knew I had to meditate in that word day and night. When I felt like it, when I didn't feel like it, when I didn't want to, when I wasn't excited about it, I can't tell. Well, I probably built up excitement for it now because it's so integral to how I have to move where I actually enjoy reading the word. I also know that that's not everybody's reality. I also know that reading the word is not the priority on everybody's list and it should be because we don't live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So let's talk about spiritual nutrition and if you want if you want some review you got to go to lessons one and two and you'll have some, because we talked about nutrition, we talked about nutrients, we defined what those were. So that'll be the backdrop for what we're talking about today. I want you to receive this, two main statements. The word of God is our milk, our meat, and our bread. The word of God is our milk, the word of God is our meat, the word of God is our bread. In other words, the word of God is how we grow. If we don't digest the milk of God's word, if we don't digest the meat of God's word, if we don't digest the bread of God's word, we won't grow. Now, it's possible to be a born again child of God, but still be a baby in Christ or still be an infant in Christ or to still be immature in Christ, which means I. OK, I think most people believe when I give my life to Christ, I'm done like I'm a miss hell. So I'm straight. But really, when we give our life to Christ, that's just kindergarten. That's, that's the basement floor. We got some growth and we got some developments. We got some classes we got to graduate to. We've got some higher learning we need to attain. So, yeah, my soul is going to rest with Jesus when I leave this place. But what about why you're here? Because preferably you'll be here on this planet a good long while. What kind of life will you live while you're still walking amongst the living? 
Salvation is not the end all be all. Salvation is the introduction into the life that God wants us to live. And to sustain that life, we need the milk, we need the meat, and we need the bread of God's word. The word of God is meant to sustain us in every aspect of life. The word of God is meant to sustain us in every aspect of life, spirit, soul, body, socially, financially, everything that concerns you, the word of God has instruction for it and answers to it. Amen. And we have to believe that. I remember I was talking to a young lady. Well, she was older than me, but she was still a young lady in my eyes. I was talking to a young lady and she was dealing with some life issues. And so I was counseling her out of the word because everything I do, everything I say, everything I believe is based on the word. And so I kept hitting her with scripture. I kept giving her biblical principles and she stopped me. She said, wait a minute, you really believe this stuff, don't you? <laughs> I said, yes, ma'am, I do. I do really believe it. That's all I got for you. I'm not, I can't give you no psychology. I can't give you a, a psychiatric breakdown. I can give you the word because I know the word works in my life. And if God says we're supposed to live by every word that comes out of his mouth, I'm going to live by every word that comes out of his mouth. And as we do that, I believe our lives will begin to align with what he said in his word. So if I said the word is our milk, the word is our meat, the word is our bread, let's talk about that. The word sustains us. You ever felt weak spiritually? You ever felt like you just weren't doing, how, you weren't doing what you should do as a child of God? You know you've given your life to him, but you, just, you can tell by your reaction. You can tell by the way you move on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm not where I need to be. I don't want you to think that that means you're a bad believer. I want you to understand that means you're malnutritioned. That means you're trying to, you're trying to work a full day's work on an empty stomach. Anybody ever tried that before? You had to work like 10, 12 hours and you hadn't eaten anything? That's not a good place to be. And your body will let you know you got a little while before I shut down on you. And you're probably a little short with people. You're probably not as nice as you normally are because you are operating from a nutritional deficit. Well, it's the same way with our spirit, man. Sometimes we are operating from a, a spiritual nutritional deficit and we can tell how uh, built up we are by how we respond or react to situations that come our way. Uh, when we were having prayer yesterday, the Spirit of God led us to where we were praying for like the first 45 minutes of the hour. And then those last 15 minutes, we would talk about what we prayed and see if anybody else heard anything. And one of the sisters saying that she we were talking about growth and she was realizing that she was growing because she hit an incident where in the past, somebody might have got all the smoke. They might have got all the lip and might have got a little hand action, too. But she said she responded differently and she realized I'm growing. I'm growing because I would have handled that situation a lot differently a month ago, two months ago, six months ago, a year ago. But because we're spending time in the word and because we're spending time with him, we begin to grow and we handle situations differently. That's how you know when you're growing spiritually, you start handling situations differently. Amen. So if you are not satisfied with the way you're handling a situation, that's an area you need to grow in spiritually. It's not a bad thing. It's just an eye opener to where, oh, I'm spiritually. I, there's a spiritual deficit in this area. Not, I'm not a backslider. I ain't, I ain't an old sinner saved by grace. I was a sinner. I'm saved by grace. Now I'm God's child and I need to grow. I just need to grow up. That's all. I just need to grow up in this area. I need to grow up. It's not something I'm going to beat myself up about. It's just an area I need to grow up in. So let's talk about the bread. The word of God is the bread of life. Let's look at John chapter six. If it's the bread of life, if I want to live life, I need to digest it. Right. I need to be if the word of God is the bread of life. I need to be chewing on some spiritual cornbread every day. Some spiritual muffins, some spiritual biscuits. I need some spiritual carbs in my life every day if I'm going to do what God wants me to do. So look, look at what the Gospels tell us in John chapter 6. I'm going to read verses 32 through 35, and then I'll read verse 48 and verse 63. John chapter 6, verse 32. says, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which comes down from heaven and gives life unto the world. 
Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. They said, since you got this good bread, give it to us. Break us off. We want some of this bread you're talking about. Verse 35, Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger, and he that believes on me shall never thirst. So Jesus identifies himself as the bread of life. What kind of life? Natural life or spiritual life? Jesus is talking about a spiritual life here. Obviously, we're not talking about natural life because they understood natural bread. They understood what it meant to have bread naturally. Jesus was talking from a spiritual level. And he says, I am the bread of life because obviously you couldn't chew on Jesus. So he was letting them know I am who you need to be with. The Oh, that's good. That's good. OK, I got ahead of myself. Look at verse 48. Verse 48, he doubles down on. It. He said, I am that bread of life. He made a very complete statement there. He said, just in case you didn't catch me the first time, hear me this time. I am that bread of life. And then look at verse 63. He said, it is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. Look at this. Ooh, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are what? Life. So the words that Jesus speaks are the life and the spirit we need to lead a healthy and a whole spiritual life. Which means I have to digest what God says through Jesus as often as possible. Joshua 1, 8 says day and night. I have to digest what God says through his word every day so I can have the spiritual nutrition necessary to live for him. How often? Every day. When he says I'm the bread of life, he says I'm the food of life, food a bread is typically synonymous with food. And what is food? We know food is like sustenance. You know, it's what you need, it's what you need to make it through that day. It's the energy you need. It's the, it gives you the strength you need to do what you gotta do that day. Well, God is letting us know that this word is the strength you need to do the life of a believer for every single day. So if I look, if I'm not digesting the word for that day. I didn't have the strength I needed to be a believer to represent him for that day, which means at some point I was deferring to myself. I was deferring to my flesh and what I thought about it instead of what God wanted me to do in that situation. The more of God's word we consume, the greater our capacity for spiritual growth and development becomes. The more we consume, the greater our capacity becomes, which means if I want to know more about God, I got to eat more of God. I have to get more word. If I want to grow, I got to eat. It's simple as that. His word is food for our spirits. So if it's like if you, you ever seen somebody that seemed on the outside like they were a spiritually mature person and you wanted to emulate and, and kind of line yourself up with the way they moved, well, the only way you can do that is by eating the same amount of word they're eating. You got to find out what their diet is and you got to eat what they eat. If they tell you, I read about five hours a day, you might change your mind about trying to be like them after you find out how much they consume. I was talking to somebody a while ago and they were talking about how somebody was a competitive bodybuilder. And this was years ago. And I think they said he ate 100 egg whites a day. But that was his profession. So in order to gain the calories and the mass necessary, he had to consume way more than is really healthy for a normal average adult. So the person that was talking to him was like, yeah, I would love to be as big as he is, but I'm not eating 100 egg whites a day. So sometimes we want to be where someone is or do what someone is doing, but we don't have the appetite they have. And so we need to be honest about our intentions, about our desire and our appetite. Am I eating enough? For me to be where I want to be in God, am I eating enough? Am I digesting enough of the bread of life? He already saw, we already saw in 1 Peter 2 that his word is the milk that we need. Now we know it's milk and bread. So if I don't digest his word, I won't have the spiritual food necessary to live the life that God desires for me to live. And we can pray all day long. We were having a conversation about prayer and fasting before service started. We might have to start doing a pre-flow. 
We got after flow. We might have to start doing a pre-flow before service start, just chopping it up about some spiritual things. Because y'all been missing out on some pretty good conversations early, early in the morning around that, that 9, 30 to 10 o'clock spot. We have some pretty dope conversations. Uh, we'll see about that. But in the meantime, I have to digest the proper amount of spiritual nutrients to live the way God wants me to live for that day. For that day. Well, Lord, I need your strength for the day. Because you're my daily bread. So often we look at what we got to do next week, next month, next year. I don't know if I can live for God the rest of my life. I'm only 18. No, 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 no. Day by day. Day by day. Don't look at it like you're only 18, you're only 20, you're only 30. Day by day. Lord, I'm going to live for you today. Because the more of your word I consume the greater my capacity for spiritual growth and development becomes. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Y'all with me? Amen. What we got to do? We got to grow. We got to grow. God doesn't want us to be spiritual babes any longer. He wants us to grow. He wants us to develop. He wants us to mature in the things of God. Now, the thing before I share, before I read from 1 Corinthians 3, I want to make this very clear. Don't compare yourself to somebody else. Don't compare. I know sometimes it's, it's just human nature to say, okay, I want to do what they do. I want to respond how they respond. Just be your authentic self and grow in your authentic self. Say, okay, I recognize this is how I am. I can be better. I can do more. Let me grow to be a better version of myself in Christ. I don't want to try to grow and be this person. I don't want to try to grow and be that person. I don't want to try to grow and be that group of people. I want to be the best me. I want to be who God created me to be, and I'm going to digest his word so I can grow and become the best version of myself in him. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, starting at verse 1, Paul is talking to the church at Corinth. He said, I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto what? babes in Christ. So Paul is saying, I wanted to share some stuff with y'all, but I couldn't even do it because y'all weren't spiritually mature enough to receive it. He said, I had to talk to y'all as babes in Christ. So now we understand that there are levels in Christ that we can be babes or we can be mature or we can be in the process of maturing. Verse two says, I have fed you with milk and not with meat. See, so now we know the word is milk. The word is meat. And the word is bread. He said, I fed you with milk and not with meat. Well, why did you do that, Paul? He said, because you were not able to bear it. Neither yet now are you able. Now, I wasn't going to go to verse three, but I believe it's important for us to see how we can determine whether or not we need milk or meat if we babes or we're maturing. He said, I wanted to speak to you about spiritual stuff in verse one, but you're carnal. Carnal means you're moved by your flesh. Instead of allowing me to lead you, your flesh is driving you. Your, your flesh is propelling you. You know, when your flesh tell you, go on, cuss them out. You'd be like, yeah, I'm going to get them. Well, your spirit man would be like, no, leave, leave them alone. Let it go. If I cuss them out instead of letting it go, that was a flesh move. That was a carnal decision I made because I allowed my flesh to override my spirit man. He's saying, you, I couldn't speak to you like spiritual folks because you were carnal. He said, I fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able. How did Paul know they were carnal? Verse 3, for you are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as what? Mere men. He said, I can tell that you weren't ready for more by how y'all behaving. He said, he said, there's strife among you, there's envy among you, there's divisions and cliques and separations. I couldn't talk to you about spiritual stuff because your behavior let me know you weren't ready for more mature things. And we do that as believers on separate, just on our own. We'd be like, God, I want more of you, more of you, more of your power, more of your glory. And then we start cussing folks out. We go off on folks. We we treat folks when we judge folks. We, we do all the stuff that our flesh wants to do and then wonder why we aren't growing. Now, when I say we, I'm talking about all of us, the body of Christ, because we all have our moments. And we wonder why we aren't growing in God. It's because we are making flesh deposits instead of spirit deposits. I'm feeding my flesh. Every time I give into my flesh, I'm feeding it. 
Every time I submit to the spirit, the spirit man in me is growing. We believe that man is a spirit. He has a soul. He lives in a body. So my flesh is where my body kind of makes the most noise. My, the flesh operates through the body. So if I feed my body more, my flesh is going to dominate. You ever wanted to do something for God, but your, your flesh just wouldn't let you? Like you made a commitment, okay, I'm going to wake up in the morning and I'm going to pray. I'm going to wake up in the morning, I'm going to read. I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And your, your, you had good intentions, but your flesh was like, nah, bro, what you going to do is hit this alarm and roll over. What you going to do is go get you something to eat and get back in the bed. You need some rest. Our flesh tells us our spirit man can't tell us what to do. If we don't feed, that's why it's so important that we feed our spirits the word of God, because the more you feed it, the stronger he becomes or the stronger she becomes. And the stronger your spirit becomes, the better decisions and choices you're able to make. Where I move beyond, I don't feel like it. And I move into, I have to do this. I got to grow. I, I, I can't stay where I am. I've been here long enough. I don't like the results I'm seeing. I got to grow. I got to change my diet. I'm not eating enough of God's word because I'm making decisions based on how I feel and not based on what I believe. I got to make choices based on what I believe, not on what I feel, because how I feel can lie to you. How I feel can be wrong. So I can't trust how I feel. I got to trust what I believe and I have to believe God's word. And the more I feed on God's word, the more I grow in my belief of what he said and how it applies to me. Amen. Listen, we cannot grow spiritually apart from the word of God. Y'all know I've been preaching that from the rafters for years. Our success is in God's word. I believe this with all my heart. And normally I say for the body of Christ, I believe this for us, Victory Through Faith Church family. I believe that what God wants us to do, where he's taking us and what he's bringing to us, we have to ensure that we are rooted and grounded in the truth of his word. Because that has to be what propels us forward. That has to be what guides us. I can't move by what I think. I can't move by what I feel. I have to move by what I believe. And I believe what God said in his word. So if I make a decision that's outside of God's word, I have to amend that decision by aligning my thoughts, aligning my speech and my actions with his word. Amen. Now, some areas it's going to hurt a little bit because your flesh don't want to give up control. Your flesh wants to make sure it keeps running things because it feels good to feed your flesh. Y'all ever notice that everything about your flesh feel good to you? It feels good to you physically, but it, it, it hurts you spiritually. You feel further and further away from God, but your flesh like, yes, sir, this is all we wanted right here. This is all we, this just what we needed. But your spirit man is like, I'm over here dying. I'm over here weaker than weak. Because your flesh and your spirit don't want the same things. Ooh, wow. Your flesh and your spirit don't want the same thing. I know. We are new creations in Christ Jesus. Old things passed away and behold, all things became new, but not your flesh. You got the same flesh you had before you gave your life to Christ. And that flesh said, OK, your, your, your spirit been reborn, your spirit been renewed. So we still want to cuss. We still enjoy cussing. So praise God, you going to heaven. Let's cuss. <laughs> Let's cuss while we're here on earth. We finna cuss out today. You ain't cussed in a month. We finna make up for lost time. Because your flesh says, this is what I want to do. Let's do it. It's only when we say, no, I'm choosing not to. Because I'm not letting my flesh tell me what to do. I'm being spirit led. I'm allowing the Holy Spirit who resides within my spirit to tell me what to say, to tell me what to do, to tell me when to move. I was talking to somebody this morning about how the spirit of God will lead you in every aspect of your life. I can't count the amount of times I've been driving on the highway and the spirit of God will let me know, like, they're about to turn. Well, are they about, in other words, they're about to come into your lane. And I'm looking like they don't have no blinker on. And you can tell sometimes by folks head that they getting ready to turn before they even put on the blinker, if they even put one on. And the spirit of God will be like, they're about to turn. They're about to get in your lane. Now, I got a choice. I can believe that and slow down 
or I can speed up and cause a problem. <laughs> so it's my response to his instructions that, in, that determine what I experience. And I sometimes I obey, I slow down, and before I know it, sir, sir, sir. And sometimes I'd be like, well, they're going to hang it in front of me today. And I speed up a little bit. I ain't passed that test. I don't know what it cost me, but I ain't pass it. <laughs> because I wasn't feeling like getting passed at that point. You, you got a blinker for a reason. So I fed my flesh sometimes. Fed my spirit man other times. God's, God never stopped loving me. He didn't say, oh, you missed that test. I got to hurt you now. I got to call your car to break down. You ain't let them get in front of you. I told everybody, so that. come on now, come on, flat, boom, flat tire. I used to think that way. I used to think that if I disobeyed God, he was going to cause something to happen to me or my vehicles or something I had. That was real talk. That's what made me start tithing when I was younger. I ain't want my car to break down because I had an older car. Built in 1978. I was born in 80, so the car was older than me. <laughs> so I, I, I was like, I'm going to tithe because I don't want to break down. I don't want this thing to be smoking in front of Parker when we do our drive-by after high school. So I'm going to make sure I tithe because I don't want to be over here passing because you know you drive over through Ramsey. You can't bag back. You can't turn around. You stuck. So when I go to these other schools, me and my friends, I want to make sure that my car is in proper working order. So Sunday... I'm tired. <laughs> now, look, the music I was playing in that car wasn't glorifying God at all. But I believed that by tithing, he was going to let my car keep running. Because he said, I open up the windows of heaven, pour you out a blessing. I need every blessing you got. I wasn't tithing because, look, I wasn't tithing because I loved him so much. And he's been so good that I have to return the tithe to him. I was tired because I didn't want my car to break down. I didn't want to have a flat tire. I didn't want my radio stolen while we were parked in places we had no business being in in the first place. <laughs> oh, I'm sure God be looking at us like, yeah, you tripping. You tripping. Now, I grew in my understanding of what it meant to tithe, and I grew in my understanding of what it meant to actually be a child of God, understanding that just because I make a mistake and just because I miss it doesn't mean God changes his mind about me. Because he's love. And because I love him, there are some things that I, ooh, y'all catch this, this is good. Because I love him, there are some things that I choose not to do that I want to do that won't glorify him. That's what love is. Love is, love ain't, oh, everything I want he gives me, I just love him. So love is, I want to do this, but it'll hurt the person I'm connected to, so I'm not doing it. Love ain't just what you do for a person. Love is what you refuse to do because you're with a person. Y'all know what? I would love to tell y'all I got that revelation from the Bible. Y'all know where I got that revelation from? Boomerang. Y'all remember when Eddie Murphy stepped out on, on Holly Berry and then he came home and she told him love would have brought your behind home last night? I said, man, that's true. I learned the principle in love that day watching that movie before I was old enough to know what love meant in a relationship. Because that thing resonated with me. She, she said, love would have brought you home last night. Don't come telling me you love me after you didn't deal with your flesh wanted to do. Because if you really loved me, you would have told your flesh, I got to go. Jesus talks about that. He said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? He said, I'm not your Lord for real, because if I was your Lord, you would obey me. And we, say, we, we sing all the great songs. Lord, I love you more than anything. Well, love is not doing what we want to do because we love the person we're not doing it for more. Or we love God enough to not misrepresent him. There are some things that I refuse to do, not because I don't want to do them, but because I don't want to misrepresent y'all. And it ain't heaven or hell stuff. It's just the optics of it wouldn't look good. And therefore, I'm not going. I'm not going to be there because I don't want anybody that fellowships here to ever be embarrassed about something they pastor did. So there's some things that just, it ain't going to hurt me if I don't go. Yeah, I'll be all right. Something else will come along. 
And there are some places where the Spirit of God does allow me to go. It ain't a big deal. If somebody sees me there and they're a spiritually immature believer and they, they can't get with it, then I'll pray for them. <laughs> but one thing you can't, that's good. Let me make that clear distinction. You cannot, oh, this might shift there. Okay, let me say this. You cannot live your life for people. If you live your life for God, people will, will be impacted, though. But if you make your choices based off people, I ain't going to go because he'll be upset. And if you stay, they're going to be upset anyway. Just go. Whether you go, whether you stay, they're going to be upset. What are you feeling? What is God letting you know is acceptable for you? Some things acceptable for one person aren't acceptable for the next because they have a more tender conscience. I can't. I'm looking forward to the day where the Spirit of God lets me teach on our conscience, on our scruples, on how, for instance, I don't curse. I don't curse. If I'm around somebody that curses, it's not making me feel like, oh, Jesus Christ, this is just burdening my spirit. I feel like, oh, my goodness, they're just vexing me. It's just a, it's a decision I'm, I made because I, and I used to. I used to get down with the get down. And then I realized that if I am actually a true believer and I want people to understand who I serve, I don't want to muddy the waters by my own indulgence. Wow. In other words, yeah, I can do it, but should I? How does it impact my witness? There are a lot of things we shouldn't do, not because it's a heaven or hell issue, but because it will negatively impact our witness. Because some things that, that we do personally aren't a problem until you realize that that person is in a position of power or authority. Right? Well, guess what? So are you. You're kings and priests. You're peculiar people. You've got authority. You've got power. God put it in you when he placed the Holy Spirit in you at your salvation experience. We represent the kingdom of God. There are some things that we shouldn't do, not because God's going to strike us down. There are some things we should do simply because it won't reflect well on the kingdom of God. Right? I've always wondered, I know, I, know it's, I know it's like a religious thing where we hold people in leadership more accountable than what we call lay people. That's people that uh, attend church but might not have a position in church like pastor, uh, prophet, deacon, anything like that. I've always thought it strange that it's okay for, like we'll accept it if it's a lay person but it's unacceptable if it's a pastor or a deacon or something, but we're all in the same body of Christ. Like, why do certain people get passes? We should all be living to glorify God, not ourselves. Now, if there, if there are things, okay, wow, I guess it's part of growth. That's why he's taking this time talking about this. If there, if there are things that you do that you don't believe are a problem between you and your relationship to God, however can be per perceived the wrong way, do yourself a favor and keep those things to yourself. Keep those things private. I remember hearing a pastor talk about one time about how he, him and his wife like to dance, but they can't go certain places because they see pastor and his wife dancing at the place, they're going to be like, what they doing here? Same thing you doing here. But you don't want to see your pastor at a place dancing, or you don't want to see your pastor at a bar with a, a glass on front. Like, who wants to show up and introduce their pastor? Be like, hey, this is my pastor. Right? Talking about what? <laughs> on the rocks? That's your pastor? <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. And that first lady? <laughs> you wouldn't be. You wouldn't be too excited to introduce your pastor and first lady if they were at a bar with a couple of drinks. And a couple of empty glasses still sitting on the counter, right? Well, guess what? What makes you different? You don't, so it's not acceptable for your pastor, but you get a pass? Aren't we all children of God? What about your witness? You got folks that'll never walk in a church to see your pastor, but they see you all the time. What about your witness? You can impact you can impact people for the kingdom of God just as strongly, if not more, than your pastor can. See, when you come here, I'm feeding you the word. 
My job is to empower and equip. When you leave, you're supposed to spread it. You're supposed to impact the people you come into contact. You come here to get fed, then you leave to spread. That's good. You come here to get fed. When you leave, you spread. I remember this. This freed me so much. I heard this years ago. I want to say it was Dr. Bill Winston. I don't know if it was original to him, but he was the first man of God that I heard say it. He said, pastors are not responsible for producing sheep. We know you hear people say that in the body of Christ, a pastor is a shepherd and he's over sheep, right? So he said, pastors are not responsible for producing sheep. Pastors are responsible for feeding sheep. And sheep, when they are healthy, will reproduce themselves. That, that resonated with me. I heard that probably over a decade ago. That resonated with me. It's not my job to create sheep. It's my responsibility to feed who God brings my way. And when they become healthy and strong, they reproduce themselves. That's what God wants us to grow, to become healthy and strong. The more of God's word we consume, the greater our capacity for spiritual growth and development becomes. Now, we cannot grow spiritually without the word of God. We can want to grow. We can have a desire to grow, but it won't happen apart from the word. Let's look at 1 Peter 2 again. This was our lesson text, and I wanted to come back to it to drive this point home. 1 Peter chapter 2. Y'all ready to grow for real, though? I ain't just talking, am I? I really, I really, I'm excited about seeing how we grow because I'm excited to see what, what growth looks like on all of us. I got to grow. I'm the pastor and I still got to grow. Every believer should be growing. And so there, there are areas in our lives that we have to dedicate to God so we can grow in those areas. First Peter chapter 2 we read it earlier. It bears reading again. Verse two says, huh. well, verse one says, put verse one up there for me real quick. Verse one says, wherefore, laying aside all malice and guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings. In other words, lay your flesh aside. Lay your flesh. Well, it's just me. This is who I am. OK, lay it aside, though. That's a poor excuse for bad behavior. It's just who I am. When I, when I was dating before Mel came along, I knew when I was in a relationship with somebody, with a female, and she said, this is just who I am, I already knew. We won't be together long. We won't be together long. I ain't, because I'm not obligated to you. We dating, we ain't married. So when you say, well, this is just who I am, I already see this is a person who refuses to grow. When we say this is just who I am, that means I'm not willing to put in the work necessary to become a better version of myself. Now, I'm talking about I'm talking about emotionally poor habits and, and, and characteristics that are flawed. I'm not talking about if she dark skinned and you say, well, I just wish you was light. And she said, this is just who I am. Ah, you can't change. No, she can't change, brother. You knew her skin color when y'all started dating. That shouldn't change. But, it, but, if she, but if she's been hurt in the past and so when you say things that trigger her hurt and she responds to you angrily, you got to let her know, I'm not who you've been with. Oh, Lord. Babe, I gamed you up a couple of times. We were dating, right? I gamed her up, y'all. I gamed her up. We, we, we were dating, and, and I was saying some stuff or doing some stuff that reminded her of some stuff she had been in that wasn't really good. And I told her, I said, uh-uh, I can't pay the price for who you've been with. This is a whole nother situation. This is a whole nother relationship. I'm not him. So I ain't going to pay the price for what he did. Now, that means she had to decide whether or not she was going to trust me or stay in that, ooh, or stay in that little cocoon of emotion, you know, that little wall we put ourselves behind when we've been hurt. And we still want, we still crave love. So we, we still reach out to other people until they remind us of what hurt us. Then like a turtle, we, we draw back into that shell. We have to break past that. Listen to this for someone who is worthy of coming out of it. And that requires some time spent. OK, I see this moving fine. That don't move me, Bubba. I'm watching your actions. 
You can say all day, I love you. Oh, you're the only one for me. I love you so much. I can see myself with you for the rest of my life. Okay. <laughs> Meow mix commercial. What are you doing? Are you there for me when I need you? Am I a priority in your life? Oh, Lord. I didn't know how much of a priority mail was for me until I started making moves I wouldn't normally make. Before I was dating, I, ooh, y'all, can I tell y'all a little bit about my pre-melody history? Ooh, Jesus, man, you talking about a selfish something in a relationship. Man, I, I ain't know I was selfish until I met Mel and fell in love. Oh, my goodness, I was so selfish. What you want to eat? I don't know. I kind of want some, I don't want that. <laughs> what you want to watch? Well, I don't know. Let's go. Well, I, don't, I don't really have nothing I want to watch. Well, let's watch this. We watch the movie. When we leave, I'm fussing. That was hard. What? Why you took me there? That, like she produced the movie. That movie was horrible. That was a waste of our time and money. She didn't direct the movie. She didn't produce it. I didn't make a choice. And when I didn't like what we saw, it was her fault. Oh, I was so selfish. Oh, I'm so glad God cha changed me. I'm so glad he changed me. I was a mess. You hear me? Sometimes we encounter people before they encounter themselves. When I was dating pre-male, I didn't know me. And so how could I really love a person if I didn't know myself to give myself to a person? I didn't know what I was offering. I didn't know what I had to offer. I didn't know what I required. And so I was just out there doing stuff. Like a lot of us do, we just do stuff. We react in relationships instead of saying, okay, this is what I have to offer. When you're dating me, you're dating somebody that's loyal. You're dating somebody that's got a spiritual background. You're dating somebody that's not going to be out here treating you any kind of way. You're dating somebody that you don't have to worry about stepping out on you. This is what you're getting. What are you offering? If it's a hot girl summer for you, we ain't compatible. <laughs> no, because that's not what I'm looking for. Y'all got to look. When you're dating, you got to make your intentions known up front. What are we doing? What are you doing? I know you might be 17, 18, 20, you ain't really thinking about marriage. Okay, but every relationship is an understanding of what I do and don't want in marriage. Because every failed relationship has a lesson in it. Ooh, y'all heard that? Every failed relationship has a lesson in it. What did I learn about me? And what did I learn that I won't tolerate? For me, I don't smoke. So when I was when I exchanged numbers with a young lady, then I went. What's that area? Uh, uh, I don't even know what it is. I came up down the street from More Than Comforts. What's that street? Denison. I was dating a young lady, and she lived off of Denison. When I pulled up, and she had a black and mild in her mouth, I knew it was over. <laughs> Cause I don't smoke. <laughs> if I don't smoke, I'm not gonna be in the car with a who. Smoker. She was a beautiful girl, nice girl, great personality, but I wasn't checking for that. Wasn't checking for that, so I knew when I pulled up, oh yeah, this <laughs> this, a, this a pretty much a wrap. I mean, I was cordial that day. I think we might have dated a couple of times. We might have went a couple of places, but I knew it in. Nah, this one, nah. It, 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 Mel and I always talk about it was one of my non-negotiables. Because at this point, I'm dating I'm not trying to marry the next person I'm dating, but I'm dating with marriage in mind. So, no, we, we nah, 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 not gonna work, not gonna work. Uh, this is funny, my mom reminds me that I'm gonna get off my pre-mail history. My mom tells me this all the time, I didn't even realize I told her, but I was dating a person, and uh, I think she lived in Fairfield. And I went to pick her up, and when she came out the house, I don't even remember what she had on, but her, uh, I don't even remember what it was, but for some reason, her, her underwear was showing. And I was like, no, nah. no, nah. no, we ain't going nowhere. <laughs> yeah. we, and we didn't go nowhere now. She could have went somewhere when I left. I said, no, because I'm not going anywhere with somebody. I'm going to say what I said, because my mom all reminded me. I told her, I said, I ain't going nobody, nowhere with nobody with their panties showing. 
Now, I don't remember what she had on. I don't think it was nothing obscene, but for me, it was just something where, where like, I don't want you advertising when you with me. Not at that point in my life anyway. And in a way that I felt like might not be appropriate. So for me, it was inappropriate. I'm sure looking back on it now, I was probably tripping because it wasn't that big a deal because at that age, we like 16, 17, so she living with her folks, so it ain't like she came outside, headed to, you know, the little club down the street to work all night. It wasn't that type of situation. But for whatever reason, it just bothered me at that moment. And so for me, it was a non-negotiable. Okay, 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 okay. Okay. Anybody have or had a quote-unquote list when it came to finding somebody or who you were, who you're gonna be with, whether you wrote it down or it was mental? There should be some non-negotiables on your list. For instance, if you're a believer, you can't be trying to marry somebody that's not a believer. That's what being unequally yoked means. Unequally yoked, I say this and sometimes saints hear this or sometimes ain'ts hear this and they don't believe me or they don't get in agreement with beliefs. Being unequally yoked is not a person of color being with a Caucasian person. It has nothing to do with a black person being with a white person. Being unequally yoked has nothing to do with race. It has everything to do with belief. You are unequally yoked if you are a believer, a child of God, and you are connecting with somebody that does not believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, that is being unequally yoked. It has nothing to do with the color of a person's skin. The Bible never said that. Man made that up and ran with it. And so we heard it and we thought, well, if you were a white person, that means you unequally yoked. God can't bless that union. Find it in the scripture, please. That's what I mean by we have to live our lives based on the word of God, not based on what other people feel about a situation. Now, if you got a, if you got an issue with uh, what, what do we call it when interracial marriage, if you got an issue with that, that's something you got to take to God. You can keep it to yourself. Everybody looks straight ahead and smile. So don't nobody know what you're thinking. You, but you can keep that to yourself. Take that to God. For God, that's not an issue. If that was an issue, then he would not have let Moses remarry. Moses married a lady of color. Did y'all know that? Abraham married a lady of color. When Sarah died, he married Keturah. She was a lady of color. Wait a minute. Father Abraham had many sons. And many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them. And so are you, you, you. Interest yourself. <laughs> yeah, Father Abraham that had them many sons. Some of them sons were interracial. <laughs> so Abraham is considered to be the father of the faith and God allowed him to be involved in an interracial marriage. Guess what? We need to stop tripping. Sila. Now, I understand we've had some bad experiences when it comes to race. And so I understand the stigma associated with it. Be, be honest about your personal trauma with it. Don't try to make it spiritual. That's all I'm saying. If you got an issue with that, if you, if you feel a certain way, you are entitled to feel how you feel. Just don't try to co-sign God's name at the bottom of that check. Because he ain't authorized that. That's a, that's a flesh move. And if you ain't ready to lay it down, hey, you can still love God how you want to love God. When you're ready to lay it down, take it to him. He'll help you lay it down. Just know there's no biblical basis for you to stand on when you say God's against interracial marriage. Y'all got me? Don't know how we got on that, but somebody need to hear it. That's going to deliver somebody. <laughs> You'll never look at Abraham the same again, will you? <laughs> As newborn babes decide. Think about this. See, that's what happens when the blessing is on your life. Abraham was over 100 years old when he remarried, and he still had more children with Keturah. The blessing is something else. I'm telling you, the blessing will override your human weaknesses. The blessing will place you in a position to where humans think it can't be done. God says, say less. <laughs> God, I got this. I'm good. Come on. I got you. I'm with you. Since I'm with you, it's possible. Because I can do all things through who? Who does what? Do we believe that? Well, let's see. So let's talk about. Pray for power and grow in grace. This is one of the things. It didn't necessarily come out. It's connected to spiritual nutrition. We understand that we got to feed on the word of God, right? Y'all got that? 
Spiritual nutrition is about us feeding on the milk, the meat, and the bread of the word of God. It's how we sustain our livelihood. What I want y'all to see, and this, God doesn't often give us mandates. He'll give me a personal mandate or personal instruction. He doesn't often give a mandate to the church. This is one of the few times I remember God giving a mandate to us, the church, victory through faith. So listen to this. Our mandate, victory through faith church, is to grow. Say grow. 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 Why is he saying this? Because we cannot be spiritual babies any longer. What are spiritual babies? Spiritual babies are people that love God but might not always make the right decisions for God. And we all have those moments where we love God, but we don't always make the decisions that honor God in our day-to-day -day lives. And what he's showing me to show to us is that he's asking us to grow. Now look at 2 Peter 3, verse 18. This is where it came from. And it's like as soon as I read it, the Spirit of God spoke to my heart. He said, this is the mandate for Victory Through Faith Church. Because we are growing numerically, he's saying, I also want you to realize you need to grow spiritually. Now, he's not saying I'm upset with y'all. Let me be clear. God's not saying I'm upset with y'all so y'all need to grow. He's saying I love y'all and for where I want y'all to go, y'all got to do what? I've got an a eight-year-old son. He has to grow. I'm not upset with him because he's eight. Be like, what? What's wrong with you, boy? How long are you going to be eight? No, 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 no. I realize my desire for him is to what? So it's my responsibility and my wife's responsibility to nurture him, to help him. So what God is saying is that I need y'all to, and I got to nurture you through the word to do so. This is the mandate. I'm going to read it in King James, then we'll look at it and amplify it. Let me look at it in my Bible. I want to put my eyes on it. It says, but grow in grace. And in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Now, if you can put that up in the Amplified Classic version, and I want to show you all exactly how it came to me. See, this is why I say we should read our word daily, because I, I read different ways. I read because it's something I have to read and cover and understand to teach you guys. I also read because I've got several devotionals that I go through, and that's a way of me making sure I spend time uh, feeding my spirit, man. And I also read out of the Bible just for my personal edification. Because if I only read when I got to teach a lesson, I'm not going to have enough. God told me before I ever ministered my first sermon, he said, you spend time with me, you get full, and then you minister out of the overflow. So I don't have to put forth a lot of effort coming up with sermons, because what I give y'all is what God gives me after I've spent time with him. So when we get full, we minister to others out of the overflow. Look at what it says in Amplified Version. It says, but grow in grace, undeserved favor, spiritual strength, and recognition and knowledge and understanding of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Do we really have a full or a mature understanding of Jesus, of who he is, what he's done, and what that means for us? It says we got to grow in grace. Now, what really struck me is how the Amplified Version refers to grace. We've all heard that grace is what? Undeserved, unearned, unmerited what? Favor. What stuck out to me this time, and I've read this before, is that grace is also what follows undeserved favor. What are those next two words? Spiritual strength. So what God is saying is that I need y'all to grow in grace because you need more strength for where I'm taking you. He already told us pray for power. And then he added to it. He said, pray in order for power to manifest because he's already given us the power when we receive the Holy Spirit. So our need to pray is not to say, Lord, give us power. Our need to pray is for the power that we have to manifest in our day to day activities in our day to day lives. Now, in addition to that, he's saying grow in grace and grace in this context is spiritual strength. In other words, he's saying for you to do what I require for victory through faith church to do corporately and every individual member. It requires a level of spiritual strength that you have to grow into in order to achieve what I want you to do. 
In other words, he wants you as an individual to have an impact on the people around you. And he wants us as a ministry to have an impact for the kingdom of God. So we need spiritual strength to accomplish that. Now, how I knew this made faith, not sense, but it made faith is when we were talking Saturday after we came out of one of our hours of prayer, we saw uh, put second Corinthians chapter 12 on the screen for me, please. I know I, I know I freestyled on you, but I want to show everybody what came out Saturday while we were chopping it up because it, it showed me something that you ever read a scripture, you believed it, not fully understanding how it applied, though. Yeah. All my life, okay, you got verse one. All my life I had to fight. Go to verse nine. No, 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 okay. Go to verse seven. Let's look at verse seven first, because I want to give us some context. Now, this is Paul talking to the church at Corinth about what he went through, what he endured. Verse seven says, and lest, lest is just a King James old English way of saying unless, he said, and unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. Stop. Everybody look up. How many people believe a thorn in the flesh was given to him by God? Anybody heard that before where God gave him a thorn in the flesh? OK, good. That means y'all been taught properly because I can not tell you how many times I've heard people teach that God gave Paul a thorn in the flesh to keep him humble or they actually say humble. That's not what God did. That's not even an agreement with the scripture. Let's see what the Bible says. It says, OK, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. So the thorn in the flesh was what? A messenger of Satan to buffet me. Paul to fight against Paul, to oppose Paul everywhere he went and for everything he tried to do, lest I should be exalted above measure. Look, in verse eight, he says, for this thing, I besought the Lord thrice. Thrice is just King James vernacular for three times that it might depart from me. That what might depart? The thorn in the flesh that was a what? A messenger from Satan. Some, if you if you got a Bible commentary. Some Bible commentaries would say they believe that the thorn in the flesh was blindness. They believe that the thorn in the flesh was some physical ailment. That's not what the Bible says. Sometimes the Bible is so simple, you need man help to mess it up. The Bible doesn't say it was a sickness. The Bible doesn't say it was an ailment. The Bible says it was a thorn in this flesh, a messenger from Satan sent to buffet or sent to oppose Paul. And Paul said, I prayed to God three times that it might that it might what? Depart from me. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now, when I read that, I used to always think, OK, praise God, his grace is sufficient. But th that was when I had the understanding that his grace was his undeserved favor, unearned favor. So I'm like, OK, if there's a messenger from Satan opposing me, how is your favor helping me? Because we typically think favor is where God steps in and does something for you that couldn't be done on your own. And it is. It wasn't computing for me. I, was, I didn't understand how his favor was going to help me when I'm being buffeted by a messenger from Satan. Until we read 2 Peter 3.18 that says not only is grace undeserved favor, grace is also what? Spiritual strength. So let's put spiritual strength where we see grace in verse 9. And he said to me, my spiritual strength is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. So what was Paul showing us? Paul was showing us that even when I'm weak, I can receive strength from God to help me overcome what I'm going through. This was one of the revelations we got yesterday. The weaker I am, the stronger I become. You ever not did a thing because you felt you were too weak, you didn't qualify, you didn't want to embarrass God? That means you're in a good place. Because Paul said, the weaker I am, ooh, check out how he responded. 
So after Jesus said that in verse 9, look at what Paul said in verse 10. He says, therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. In other words, Paul was saying, I realize that even when I don't qualify, I'm qualified through him. The weaker I realize I am, the more of his spiritual strength I need. And God said, my grace is sufficient for you. When you don't have enough, when you don't know enough, when you don't know how to do it, my grace. When you realize you need me, that's when I kick in stronger than ever. My spiritual strength. The problem is we don't think we need them. I got it. I'm good. I'm straight. You ain't straight. Paul realized I already talked to you three times about this. What's the hold up? <laughs> he said, God, I didn't check with you three. Now you said we supposed to pray. Pray. We got to pray just to make it today. That's what you told us, God. I didn't pray to you three specific times about this and nothing happened. Ooh. Could it be that instead of removing what was afflicting Paul, God wanted to teach Paul that Paul can't fix everything. You need me in some instances. He said, my strength is made perfect through weakness because you got to realize who Paul was. Paul, when he was Saul, was a bad dude. Oh, Saul was tough. Saul was the Pharisee among Pharisees. He knew his Bible. He knew his word. He knew his law. He was multilingual. So he knew some stuff. But what you know without God don't qualify for anything. And when God wants to use you, a lot of times you got to lay down what you know so he can use you in a better way. Paul was saying, man, I didn't talk to you about this three times. What's the hold up? Why you ain't answering? He said, my grace is sufficient for you. My spiritual strength is enough to do for you what needs to be done. So Paul said, well, shoot, I'm a glory in my weakness. OK, Lord, I can't get over this. This addiction got me. I need your strength. She got me, God. I keep saying I'm going to honor you. I keep saying I'm going to honor you. But every time I go over there, man, she be having on that oil, man. I just lose it. OK, I recognize you weak. My grace is sufficient for you. I keep saying I'm going to leave him alone, God. But he keep texting me after hours. Oh, I'm so weak. Good. You need me. Instead of going through that stuff and then not talking to God about it. As if he's unaware. Like he didn't see the whole thing play out. He saw, the, he saw when you made the decision that you were going to do it before you even went through with it. The problem is we feel like we can handle it. I'm good. I got it. I'm all right. And we deceive ourselves into falling deeper and deeper into those things that we know don't please God. Because this ain't about heaven or hell. You've given your life to Christ Jesus. You've got your spot in heaven. Let's represent him on earth. Who's connected to our Christian walk? Who needs to see somebody doing it to believe that God can do it in them? I was looking for that growing up. My dad's a preacher. Praise God. I ain't looking today. I want to look at some contemporaries. I need to see another teenage dude saying, I'm not having sex that I get married because I'm saving myself for God. I was looking. I searched all over. <laughs> Couldn't find nobody. I said, well, since ain't nobody else doing it, I ain't either. I had a desire to save myself to marriage, and all I wanted was one somebody that I could find that was doing the same thing. Couldn't find nobody. So I said, well, I ain't going to be the Cleta over here <laughs> saving himself and everybody else that's doing whatever. And so I gave in to the pressure of culture. It wasn't until I got married that I was like, man, I wish I would have did what God told me to do. Woo! Man, me and lady, man, ooh. I ain't going there. I just wish I would have saved myself unto marriage like the scripture tells us to do. But I didn't see anybody doing it. So since I didn't see anybody do it, since I didn't see anybody talking about it, since I didn't hear anybody saying anything about it, it wasn't something I thought was a priority. So what do we do after we've, ooh, ooh, Lord, you going there with us? So what do we do after we've done it? I, I've done everything. 
I've made all the mistakes. I've, I've did everything that everybody does, and I'm realizing that it doesn't line up with your words. So now what, God? Am I refuse? Am I trash? Am I unusable? Are you so disgusted with my performance that you don't want to use me? Is that why I'm going through all the Hades I'm going through? Because you've seen all the mess I've made, and you say, I can't touch you. I can't do nothing with you because of what you've done. Let me help you out. That's a lie from the devil. Not only can he use you where you are, he will use what you've been through to help you reach others. Anytime you hear that you can't be used because of something you've done, you know for a fact the devil is talking to you. Because if you read your Bible for real, God used murderers. God used adulterers. The Bible says David was a man after God's own heart. And y'all know David was something else. He saw a woman bathing and said, oh, I got to have her. Lay with Bathsheba. You know he was cold. Sent her home. Then what he wanted to do is sent her home, impregnated her. She got word back to David that, hey, that wasn't just a one night stand, but I'm carrying a child. And I can't blame this on my husband because he on the battlefield. So guess what David said? David said, I'm going to bring your husband home so he can have a conjugal visit. David called Bathsheba's husband off of the battlefield, called him back to the city, told him, go spend some time with your wife before you go back. David thought to himself, which means he was trying to deceive his way out of the situation. David went to bed like, yeah, whew, I dodged one right there. Whew, y'all know, y'all, y'all, fellas, y'all know when she tell you she late. Whew. David said, whoo, I done dodged one. David woke up and Uriah was laying down on the temple step. Dude never went home. David said, I, this, he got to be the dumbest. <laughs> David like, bro, what are you doing? Uriah said, I can't go home and lay with my wife when I got soldiers on the battlefield laying their life down. Uriah had more integrity than David the king at that moment. Which means just because people occupy a position don't mean they better than you. Uriah had more integrity than David did at this moment. So David said, OK, not only. OK, so now he, he didn't have sex with another man's wife, which is forbidden in Scripture. He, he trying to deceive the husband by sending him to have relations with the wife so he can blame the baby on the husband. Now that the husband won't go home to make my plan work, he said, OK, I guess I'm going to have to graduate the murder. Check out how cold David was. David wrote a letter to Uriah's super, uh, uh, what do you call it, military when somebody's over you? Yeah, a higher ranking officer. Uriah couldn't open the letter because he didn't have the authority to do so. David handed Uriah the letter that was telling Uriah's ranking officer to place him on the front line of the hottest battle, the most intense battle. And he said, and during the middle of the battle, draw back so he's left up there by himself so he could be killed. This, was, this is the man after God's own heart. And that's exactly what David did. Uriah carried his death to his ranking officer. Gave him the letter, the ranking officer opened the letter, did exactly what David, Uriah got killed. Once David found out Uriah was killed, David called Bathsheba in, married her. But something else took place. Still got this baby to deal with. God spoke to the prophet, told the prophet to go let David know that what he think he got away with, he didn't get away with. So he gave him a, a of what he thought was like a, a false scenario. And they were like, well, whoever, whatever, whoever did that, that man needs to be killed. Prophets told David, you be the man. You got all these sheep and you took one person's sheep for your own desire. He said, you be the man. When David found out, he repented. The son was born, but he was born ill. So the Bible says that David prayed, sackcloth and ashes, that his son would be delivered. Guess what happened to that son? died. 
the maids and the servants, they were scared to tell David that the son had died because he was praying so intensely. They came and told David, said, hey, he's gone. The Bible says David got up, washed himself off. He responded completely different than what they thought he was going to do. Why? Because he would say, I was hoping, because God told me the child was going to die. He said, I was hoping that something would have changed God's mind. But now that he's dead, there's nothing else I can do. He got up, washed himself off, continued to rule. Married Bathsheba. Guess who the first child between Bathsheba and David was? Solomon, greatest, richest king to ever live. The son that took David's place, that built the temple for God. So you mean, ooh, ooh, I'm going to say it because I heard it. I don't know nobody's business, so you know it's God telling you to stop tripping. So you mean to tell me that God can bless a marriage and choose the child from the marriage whose father was killed because of what David decided to do to make him the king that rules in David's place to build God a temple for his presence to dwell, and he tripping over your abortion? Come on now. Who's lying to who? If God can do that with David and Solomon, and you think God is disqualifying you or can't use you because of an abortion you had, the devil is a lie. That's a lie from the devil. I'm here to tell you today, Get over it. That ain't stopping God from using you. That's a lie from the devil. And for any dudes that pay for it to happen, that's also a lie. God can still use you, too. I know that's the stuff we don't talk about in church. But this ain't regular church. This is a safe place and it's a place to get free. I'm letting you know what you can do when you leave. When you leave, you can tell yourself that's not a problem for God. If David can remain on the throne and God can honor his son Solomon and make him the richest, wisest king to ever live, surely he can bless me. You know, Pastor Jay, they told me, they don't know nothing. Tell them to shut up. They didn't cause more problems in this world than anybody. I can't wait to meet they. I can't wait. When I meet they, I'm slapping them on sight. I'm going <laughs> to repent later. <laughs> oh, you they. You they. Ooh, I'm charred his or her. His face, so I can't child no female day. But when I meet they, it's going to be some repenting later because I'm charging somebody up. Because they've been lying to folks for years. They have gotten folks in all, well, you know what they say. I, I'm sick of they. I'm living my life based on what this say. And if I do something based on what this say and a person doesn't understand it or approve of it, I love them, kick rocks. This is what I believe God wants me to do. This is what I'm doing. If you don't understand, that's fine. I love you too. But if you can't get with it, you can kick rocks. Or as the Bible say, get the dust off your feet and move on. That's what Jesus told his disciples. If they don't receive you somewhere, kick the dust off your feet. Keep on moving. Don't curse them. Don't bind them up. Don't tell them they're going to hell. Kick the dust off your feet and keep on moving. Okay. Yes, sir. Because I'm, I'm done Kind of, sort of, because I'm not done, but I'm done today. I'm, I'm going to say this just because I heard it. Don't argue with nobody. The worst thing you can do is try to argue Jesus to somebody. Leave people alone. Love them where you find them. Because when you introduce Jesus at the wrong time, they already shut to what you're saying anyway. So what you're saying is falling on deaf ears because they ain't paying no attention to you in the first place. Definitely when you start arguing with people about it, just love them where they are. Trust your light to shine enough for them to want to know where that light is coming from. That's good. Trust your light to shine enough for them to want to know where that light is coming from. Then you share what you believe. Then you share how God is moving in your life. Amen? Personally, you don't have to, it don't have to be the King James Version. The Lord doth shine on my heart and I am so blessed to be in his presence. I don't want to hear that. Be authentically you as you're being moved by the Spirit. I just, 
I'm in love with somebody more than myself. That's why. You don't, you, don't, you don't do what you used to do. I love somebody more than myself now. So I'm not living for myself. What does that even mean? So when you ask questions, that's when I'm going to give you more information. That's when I'm going to hit you with a little more of this biblical truth. I'm just going to hit you with the generic stuff up front to see if you're really hungry or if you're just passing by. But when you start asking questions, that's when I get more and more in-depth about what I believe. Well, I just, I live for God. And so even the things that I want to do, I don't do. Oh, there are things I don't do as an offering to who I love. There are some things I don't do because I love God more than I would enjoy it. Mm. Are y'all hearing that? There are some things we shouldn't do because we love God more than we would enjoy the thing we do. And the more you honor him by not doing that thing you would really enjoy doing, he begins to talk with you more and reveal himself more to you, and he begins to use you. And if you look, Whatever, whatever drink you've had that took you there, whatever drug you had that put you there, there is nothing that can compare to you receiving a message from God to do a thing. You do that thing and then see the result of what your obedience did. Oh, you talking about you talking about the greatest high on this planet. Doing what God tells you to do and then seeing the result of white because you won't see it all the time. God will tell you to do some, some things, and you'll never understand why he told you to do it. But in those select instances where he tells you to do a thing, and you obey, and then you see what obedience to his instruction did, nothing else comes close, especially when it changes another person's life. When he decides to use you as a vessel to alter another person's life, Boy, I pray you all have that experience. If you haven't already, I pray you all have that experience to where you hear a message or you hear a word from God, you obey what you heard, and then he allows you to see the result of your obedience. I pray you all see what that feels like. It'll change your life. And in the meantime, our responsibility is to grow. The word is meat. The word is bread. The word is milk. Just, just get your, get your, get your eat on. Get your eat on every day. Get your, get your, get your eat on. Everybody, get your eat on. Get, get, get your eat on <laughs> every day. I'm going. I gotta get my eat on. What you read? I don't know. I just gotta get my eat on. Because sometimes I read chapter to chapter, verse to verse, and sometimes I just, I skip through the Bible. Well, let, me go, let me see what Hebrew is talking about today. Read a few verses, chapters of Hebrew. Nah, that ain't really. Let me bounce over here to Mark, see what Mark talking about. Okay, that's cool, that's cool. All right, well, let me, because what I'm doing, I call it spirit-led turning. Because sooner or later, I'm going to drop on something that's like, what? That's, ex that's exactly what I'm dealing with. This been in here the whole time? <laughs> this been in here the whole time? Yeah. Commit some time every day to get in it. Y'all know you can also listen to it. Y'all got, got the Bible app. You know the Bible app will let you, if you got the right version, it'll let you play the scriptures while you're driving. There's so many ways you can get the word into you. There's no reason not to now. Just feed on it. It'll help you grow. Amen? Amen. That's all I got for you today. If you got something out of that, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. <laughs> yeah, buddy. And to my online crew, we appreciate you for fellowshipping with us. I pray that you were blessed by something you heard today. Remember this. You are empowered by faith. You are equipped for service and your success is in God's word. We love you. Be blessed in Jesus' name.